Hello, everyone. Good to see you. I am Chris Summerick, Executive Director of Humanities Nebraska, and welcome to our fifth Curiosity Connections program. Uh, one of the ways that we are celebrating 50 years of enriching people's lives through the humanities. Uh, again, Chris Summerick, Executive Director, and I will be introducing our speakers in a moment. First, if you are um, interested in putting in the chat where you're from, uh, we'll be using the chat to uh, watch your comments and, and just kind of uh, pay attention to who is asking questions. We'll also use the Q&A box. I will keep an eye on that for asking or answering any questions that you have during our program. But, um, you know, this is just one of the ways that 50 years ago, our organization was created to help people explore what connects us and makes us human. And one way is that uh, we as human beings uh, are, you know, one of our identities as human beings is that we're curious about the world around us. And so uh, for this 50th anniversary, we're working to spark your curiosity with these special humanities programs and conversations throughout the year. Um, today, we're going to hear the story of a married couple who since 1976 have been on the front lines of tradition and culture. Um, so how did a kid from Kansas City and a girl from rural Nebraska end up in this decades-long journey uh, together in our state? Um, as Humanities Nebraska celebrates 50 years as an organization, and while we're in Huma uh, Hi Hispanic Heritage Month right now, it seemed fitting to have Linda and Jose Garcia talk with us about arts, culture, humanities, all in Nebraska through the lens of their own 50-year journey so far. <laughs> it's a love story of sorts, uh, love um, with each other and with the work that they do. And their story also helps us tell an important story of Nebraska. So audience members, um, you can use the emojis at the bottom of your screen to react as we as we go through the program, the, the reactions. Um, if you have questions, you can um, ask them at any time, but I probably won't uh, turn to them too much. I will get going for a bit before I start turning to them, but feel free to either put them in the chat, but the Q&A box also helps me keep track of those, so um, I'll be watching both. Um, you can upvote questions uh, that uh, that you like. And and just uh, yeah, that's it. Let's get to the speaker um, introductions, and then and then we'll get going. Uh, so and it's great to see people from Omaha and Hastings, Nova Scotia, fabulous. Uh, oh, wow. <laughs> there's there's a, a great people coming in from all over. So okay, Jose Francisco Garcia is the third generation with direct paternal and maternal Mexican descendants settling in the Midwest in the early 20th century. He is a Vietnam veteran, a retired railroader, and a longtime Chicano activist, and so much more that we will hear about. Linda Garcia Perez is a 1971 graduate of the College of St. Mary and a retired children's librarian. She is an accomplished artist, as many of you know, uh, and an instructor um, and storyteller of Latino arts and culture, Linda is with the Nebraska Arts Council's Artists in Schools and Communities roster. Uh, she's on the Nebraska Story Arts Board, um, is a City of Omaha Public Art Commissioner, and an occasional instructor and docent with the Jocelyn Art Museum. Jose and Linda together have an extension collection, extensive collection of Mexican folk arts and literature. They are the founders of the Mexican American Historical Society of the Midlands, which we'll hear more about as well. Uh, now retired, uh, much of their time is spent on curating a research library of folk art and historical artifacts and media focused on the art and civic accomplishments of Spanish-speaking and surnamed peoples of the Americas, particularly here in the Heartlands. Both Jose and Linda are in Humanities Nebraska's Speakers Bureau. Uh, Linda offers a program called Storytelling in the Hispanic Oral Tradition, and Jose has several programs including Nebraska's Mexican-American legacy. So I hope you all will help me. Uh, uh, and, and I, they can't hear you clap, but <laughs> clap on your own <laughs> for Jose and Linda Garcia. And I am going to uh, open up. Oh, here come the claps, if you guys can see them. Um, oh, wow. Jose and Linda, <laughs> can you share a little bit more about 
who you are, your personal journey to this point, your own your own 50 year journey. And, and maybe just, you know, in this opening, just talk a little bit about your personal influences along the way. So and thank you again for being with us today. Well, I'm, I'm going to let Linda start because she was the original Chicana. Uh, I didn't cut it, catch up with the the Nebraska experience until 76. But Linda opened the doors, and, and this was back in the late 60s, early 70s. Um, uh, I think, my, yeah, my, my greatest influence is the College of St. Mary's and, and the art department, uh, Sister Angelo Lobato had a great influence on me. She took me to my first great boycott of the Chicano movement. And that's how I really got involved in studying more about the background. But I also noticed a lot of artists joining in and poets. So poets have a really strong influence on me because I spoke a lot of broken English. So reading uh, poem books helped me to learn English. And it was also a visual, uh, appearance for me because it had a lot of open spaces and margins so I could really rest in between. So so that's why I push poetry today. Again, we'll, we'll talk about that later, but Sister Angelo had so much and Brother William Wooger, who I student taught under a, a boys school, helped me also. And But the biggest influence I had too was Reverend Robert Nevado, who helped me get to Mexico during my senior year in the College of St. Mary's. And that visit changed my life forever to see all the art and meet all the people and the culture. And that it was, I feel the responsibility to bring part of that, what I learned to other people. And that's part of my Chicano philosophy is to learn what you can and, and to share it. That is imperative. Yeah, Lynn, well, thank my, you. Go ahead, I'm sorry, Jose, go ahead. Yes, uh, well, part of my awakening to the Chicano movement was in 1968. I grew up on a Mexican barrio on the west side of Kansas City, Missouri. And we, we lived as, as Americans. Uh, we listened to, to Pessy Klein. Um, my father did, who was a bartender, I did parties uh, at, at, in the Ozarks. Um, I, I drove, I rode my bike all over the city whenever I wanted to. I, I was an orphan at the age of six, um, but that's a long story. And we didn't know what Dia de Muertos was. We didn't know what Cinco de Mayo was. We, we, we didn't know what, who, who Emiliano Zapata was. And then 1968 happened. Well, actually it was before then, when I joined the U.S. Army January of 66, I looked at my birth certificate that I had to go get in order to enlist. Jose Francisco Garcia, that's not my name, is it? Well, it's on your birth certificate. Since I was four years old, my kindergarten teacher changed my name from Jose Francisco Garcia to Joe Frank. And everyone in Kansas City, relatives, friends, the whole enchilada knows me as Joe Frank Garcia to this very day. But in when I was 19 years old, joined the army, 20, I took the name Jose Francisco Garcia as my name, my 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 lawful name, and, th and that kind of started changing me when I when I started to assume an identity I never had. And then in '68, April or May of '68, I saw three black men go like this uh, at the podium of the Olympics in Mexico City. And then I started hearing about the massacre of the students in Mexico City. And then a little bit afterwards, Martin Luther King got got assassinated. And then Robert Kennedy got assassinated. And I was in Washington, D.C. at the time, uh, waiting out my time to, uh, to, be, um, uh, to finish my enlistment. These things changed me. And then all of a sudden, I was out of the Army and in, in a, a university setting. And uh, I helped found it, the Vietnam Veterans uh, Against the, v uh, the Vietnam War in Kansas City. And from then on, it just was a rocket to Mars. Um, I, I became very active in the Chicano movement, um, got my degree at the University of Missouri at Kansas City, um, went to work for a year in, with farm workers in Garden City, Kansas after my graduation. 
a graduation that I didn't attend because they refused to give me my degree because of the my 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 supposedly unofficial um, exploits in the neighborhood to do my psychology studies as my final. Well, they finally said, oh, no, this is legitimate. That this was legitimate work. And I finally got my degree and worked for a year out in, in Western Kansas. And then all of a sudden, I, I decided this is a little too dangerous for this Chicano. Because I got run out of Garden City, Kansas. I only lasted there a year. So I got a job with the Xerox Corporation. Then I got a job with Aetna Corporation. And before I knew it, I, 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 started, I started working for the Commerce Trust Company. And uh, one thing led to another. And, and before too long, I had to leave Omaha, Kansas City. Ended up, ended up in 1976 in Omaha, Nebraska. At the Chicano Awareness Center, I remember that day. <laughs> that changed really my sad. life too. Wow. We were all going to be friends, by the way. We weren't going to get married. That was my my thing in college. I was never going to get married unless I had to. And it wasn't going to happen then, even. So we had to do a lot of come talking and visiting, I'll tell you. I came That's into wonderful. Omaha as, as a hypnotist. Uh, because I, I, things in Kansas City, I, have, I was married before. And the, the talk here in Omaha, after I met Linda, and uh, the divorce came through was that Linda recycled me <laughs> here in Omaha. So it, it, that began my Nebraska adventure. And wow. ever since then, uh, it, it's been quite a ride. It is, that's, that's wonderful. You, well, you, you did well. You, well, you're a lucky man for the state you came to and, and the woman by your side. Um, and, and Jose, listening to you talk about the, the late sixties, I've, you know, every once in a while when I'm talking to people about when, you know, uh, Humanities Nebraska is beginning in 19, in the early 70s and, and the National Endowment of the Humanities and the National Endowment of the Arts starting in the mid 60s. It's, you think about those times that you mentioned and all that was happening and just the turmoil and the uncertainty and everything. And, you know, people are worried about how things are today and, you know, certainly feeling that kind of thing. Um, but when you look at different points in our history, that time of like the late 60s that you were just referring to, um, really were uh, another time in our nation that we were uh, struggling to uh, navigate. And that's kind of the emergence of the, you know, National Endowment of the Humanities, National Endowment of the Arts and things like that. Um, and then Linda, I just wanted to say to you too, listening to you talk about your, that influence the teacher had on you at um, College of St. Mary is just, I, I just, you hear that a lot from people about, I don't, teachers, whether in K through 12 or college, you know, sometimes I don't know if they realize the difference they make in people's lives. So I know we're very grateful to teachers everywhere for teachers and librarians, teachers and librarians. Both. Yes. Librarians had a, such a big influence on me. And, and, and uh, speaking of librarians, Linda and I are kind of like, we're, we're somewhere or another, we, we've been connected for a very long time uh, in very many ways. And one of the ways is librarians. It, when I was in junior high school, I would go to this junior uh, West Junior High School, and I'd walk to school. It was about a two-mile walk, no big deal, maybe three. And at the end of the school day, I would literally hide in the library because of all of the tumultuous issues happening after school. Rumbles, fights, all kinds of aggressive behavior. I wanted no part of this. I'm a short dude. Uh, I, I, I was I was picked on so bad that people to this day will come to me and apologize to me when I go back to my hood in Kansas City. So I spend a lot of time in the in, in the library, and the librarians would stack books up in front of me: Life Magazine, Reader's Digest, Look. Um, I, I started reading um, uh, Jack London. I, I fell in love with dog stories. That's how I got my American experience. I didn't know what a salad was until I went to junior high school. You know, it, 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 it was all menudo and, and, and albondigas and, and sopa, you know, and, and until I hit junior high school. Then I started learning that, oh, yeah, we're, we're not all Mexicans. <laughs> we're not, a, we're, we're Mexican Americans. We're part of the American tradition, the American story. Well, Jose, that's, that's a great uh, spot to bring up a question I have for you, too. Um, 
talking about you when you mentioned you know the name that you knew yourself by Joe Frank uh you know versus Jose Francisco and, and we've talked a little bit before this about um different terms of identity and you know we're in Hispanic Heritage Month but you know uh there's there's a lot of different terminology that I think some you know some Nebraskans including me um maybe either aren't aware of correct terminology or or where or the right way to use different terms and you think about um well hispanic or latino or uh mexican american or latinx um and you mentioned another one to me mestizaje uh, sorry mestizaje and so i'm just curious if you would kind of maybe both share as you as you talk about your identity and the identity of latinos in in nebraska share a little bit about uh, the evolution of terminology. Well, it, it has been quite an evolution. We live in a country, in a nation that is quite possibly the most diverse ethnically and racially in the history of mankind. So we, we started growing up with identities and with, with all kinds of, of categories and, and dispositions. Uh, and the first one that I, uh, I was, was very, very, noticeable was when my uncles were growing up, when my tios were growing up, uh, the second generation of Americans. I heard the word spick an awful lot. I heard the word greaser an awful lot. And my uh, my tios and uncles had a horrible time. Um, they, they, they were much darker than I was. I don't know how in the world I, I, I was such a widow. Uh, in other words, so, so, so white complected, but that, 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 that's what, what I was. Uh, but all my uncles and my aunts, they were a little uh, browner than I was, and they, they had a rough life uh, to the point where my grandmother, who raised me, would make me promise that I, I would never become somebody that took tips because she remembers times that e e even though I was orphaned at six, my father that gave us to my grandmother to raise at the age of six would come and feed us every now and then at her house. Uh, he was a waiter at a at a, um, uh, at a hotel and it would be two in the morning and he wouldn't be able to buy his the food unless he had tips. And then he'd go to a hamburger, the town topic hamburger place, um, uh, come home to Mama Grande's house, open the bag and, and just tumble hamburgers on the table. We would have dinner at two in the morning, you know? So it was rough and, my, if it weren't for them and their hard work and uh, the, the examples that they set, uh, I don't know what where I would be right now. They were the ones that built everything. They were the mountains that I climbed to the top. They, they were the ones that made possible me wanting to and being a Chicano. They knew nothing about being a Chicano. All they knew about pachucos and about zoot suits. And uh, one of my tios had a raya right here. Uh, we call him 40 Cop Joe. That's another story. That'll be in the book. When I started growing up and, and went to the Army, went to, in, in, into junior college and then the university, I was a Chicano to the nth degree for two reasons. Number one, I was a self-determined person. And number two, I needed an identity. And, and I got one and I pursued it hard. That was in the 70s. Okay, we come to the early 80s. Hispanic Week arrived on the scene. National Hispanic Week. So all of a sudden, you weren't just Mexican-Americans, you were Hispanic. And then the 90s came. And here came other words like Latino. like, And then the, the 21st century arrives. You find Latinx show up among so many others. And, and these were all adjustments that the general culture made in order to help more people identify. They didn't go through the 60s like we did, or the, even the 50s. Oh, the 50s. Can I talk about the 50s? Uh, the, uh, they didn't go through the 70s like most of us did. Well, rock and roll? What was that? You know, um, The 80s and 90s was a, a, a quite a cultural, social, and ecological change in our country. And it brought the use of the word Latino as an example for people that are uh, uh, 
a Spanish surname, a Spanish language. The thing that we have in common with Latinos, with Hispanics, with Latinx people, is that the majority of us were products of 300 years of Spanish colonialism in the Americas. That was the commonality we had. The other commonality was that almost 15% of us were directly descendants of Africans that came in much greater amounts to Central, South, and Middle America and Mexico than they did to the United States. Uh, Puerto Rico is a prime example. Cuba is another prime example. Uh, two two um, uh, nationalities that lost the majority of their indigenous people uh, early of the 16th century genocide of the Portuguese that, that were brought in from the Portuguese and the Spaniards. So now we're in 2023, 20, 20, 20, are we at? 2023, you see Latinx. Latin X. There are so many, so 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 much diversity that the Latin X took the place of Chicano Chicana, Latino Latina. Latin X had no what do you call adjectives? It was everybody, and and that that was a very very contemporary term for a very ancient term. By ancient, I mean contemporary ancient. That is mestizaje. Mestizaje has the word mestizo in it. What's a mestizo? A pagan, a peon, somebody that came from the campo, um, a, a, a dirt farmer that is Spanish connected. Mestizaje is kind of like the, 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 the characteristic of, of the cultural side of, of a, a people like Linda and I. And it is without nationality. It is without flags. It is all of us. Todos somos, uh, um, todos somos uh, algo. We're all united. We're all united in, in a mestizaje type of a, of a world. It does have its, its implications though. Back in the uh, early 20th century in Mexico, there was the Raza Cosmica movement which is a very, very racist way of trying to cope with mestizo people, with mixed blood people in Mexico. There was a, a, a group of people that weren't really very respectful or very understanding of indigenous people. And let me tell you, there are 10 times more indigenous people today than there were in 1519 when Columbus hit America. Did I just give you an idea? about indigenous people. But back in 20, I mean, in 1918, Vasconcelos brought over this raza cosmica concept of racial identity. And it kind of morphed into a mestizaje movement. But we're a hundred years away from that. We're a lot more knowledgeable about what our potential is and how much a great of a part of American, the American experience we are as raza as people of, of Spanish descent. And we call ourselves Chicano because of the whole philosophy of trying to understand your own culture and really digging, but it does you no good to keep this degree and papers of who you are if you don't share what you know. Yeah. So we choose to call ourselves Chicano because of our philosophy of how we work things. In the College of St. Mary's, I had a lot of still broken English, so just trying to speak and sometimes I mispronounce word and I would have a student correct me all the time. And one day we do in speeches and she came to the question, what would you like to be called? You want to call Mexican American, Latina, Chicana? You know, she went on with these words and I looked at her and I said, why don't you just call me Linda? <laughs> we forget, we give titles to everybody. We forget to ask the people what they want to be called and what are the, their names are. So that, that be, these labels become like a, a barrier yeah. into knowing what the person really, who they really are. So, so true. I'm Linda. I'm Linda. Yeah. And I mean, just everything you both have just talked about now, just it's, it shows the complexity of human, human identity and, yeah. and just, and really coming down to individual too, what, who you think of as yourself. And, um, 
So thank you. Um, so, I mean, that makes me think about, again, get back to 1976, I guess, and you coming here, Jose, and meeting Linda at the Chicano Awareness Center and things going from there. Um, and then fast forward to now, and just a couple weeks ago, um, you gave a talk at the Center for Great Plains Studies um, about uh, Nebraska's Mexican-American legacy. And this was part of Linda being, I, I mean, I, I believe this is also part connected to Linda being an artist in residence at the Center for Great Plains Studies, which I'd love to hear more about too and how that was. But um, my question, I guess, is maybe for you, Jose, it's, it's, it's about coming here from outside of Nebraska and what you kind of observed about like, like what's unique to Nebraska in our um, in the makeup of the of Hispanic population in Nebraska, like the Mexican American heritage that you talk about, and even broader than that. And I mean, you both could just speak to that uh, to whatever extent you want. Yeah, it uh, the the I call it the Mexican presence as much as the Hispanic presence. The conquistadors when they started coming north uh, through the the trail uh, the the real. Uh, the trail, the Real Trail from Mexico, there were just one or two conquistadores. The rest were Mexican people or indigenous people from the Apache tribe, from the um, Sequoia tribe, um, uh, from the Navajo tribe. And one of these explorers was a guy named Hernan um, um, uh, Coronado. Uh, uh, Coronado wanted to become rich and he was out after the seven cities of Cibola. And he, he understood through tales that were told to him by a monk that these cities were cities of gold. Uh, so he started going north through New Mexico and started uh, ended up in Kansas, uh, a place uh, near Dodge City, Kansas. Well, there is also uh, evidence that he sent other uh, squads of other expeditions, not with himself, but with his own people up to possibly the Republican River Basin and crossed into Nebraska territory. So the, the, the Hispanic presence in the Midlands has a very long tradition. It, it, goes, it goes as far as um, 1805 when a man named Manuel Lisa arrived. Um, a, a, he was a fur trader. He built a fort up where, by where Epley Airfield is at right now. Uh, he brought the first uh, European woman and that spent a winter in Nebraska, which she did not survive back in like 1809, something like that. Manuel Lisa was the person that not only described Nebraska as old Nebraska, but he also kept the indigenous tribes, the Sioux, the Tetons, from taking the British side during the War of 1812. This man was a formidable player that legend has it named Bellevue, Nebraska, after viewing the city from a bluff overlooking the Missouri River. He, he, he had a huge role in the development of the eastern side of Nebraska. Um, and, and then you you you, you super you, you super slide up into the 19th late 19th century, when the sugar industry, the sugar beet industry of Western Nebraska started gearing up um, because of its uh, sugar beet crop from the the western the eastern side of Colorado to the western side of Nebraska. So here comes the labor that was no that that was the only labor because of the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 uh, because uh, many of the immigrants that had arrived prior and up to the Homestead Act of what 188065 were no longer wanting agricultural work they, they they were they already owned the ranches they already owned city government they already owned utilities and houses in a more urban setting or in town. So the people work in the fields, who's gonna do it? Mexicans. So here comes Hearst, uh, Randolph Hearst out of, out of California. He started building trains, laying track to go north. 
all the way through Mexico. And many, many generations of Mexican men, they were called solos, people that came alone, would hop these trains for work in the north, um, which morphed into the Bracero program of the 20s and 30s. But all of these individual single men that came in from Mexico to work the sugar beet fields of Western Nebraska, to work the packing houses of, of Omaha, Nebraska, Kansas City, Chicago, uh, and, and the railroad, my goodness. The Burlington Northern and Union Pacific needed people to maintain their track that they were laying all over the place in Nebraska. So they would bring families of Mexicans and put them every 30, 40, 50 miles on the track, give them a boxcar to live, and you maintain this track. This is yours to maintain. Well, to this very day, Linda and I will have a speaking engagement in Hastings. We'll have a speaking engagement in North Platte. And we meet people whose ancestry goes all the way back to when their families were brought into Nebraska to 10 track. Has that ever been written about? We're getting close to it. So Good. our Mexican presence is, is, it's everywhere. Can't avoid it. And Linda, I forgive me. What, what town did you grow up in? Outside, really in Omaha, but we, I, my first school was in Papillion, and we were the first uh, minorities there. So there was a lot of stories about that, some negative and some positive. But you know, all of those things, on it, whether negative or positive, would not make me the person I am today. So you, you, you adapt to those those needs to survive. And that's what I do. You live between the culture of Nabatla is be, you're in between, but in that in between is when you adjust to who you are. And so you're right on the line. You never take one over the other. You're both. So that, so that, that living culture is really important to save those words, Nabatla, because a lot of my art reflects that living in the, uh, and on the edge uh, yeah living on the edge but that's this. but on that edge is with who you are so you're seeing a lot of edgy people here <laughs> <laughs> well and linda you're you're just you're well known as an artist and as a storyteller and so i'm going to make this a two part thing and one is just um could you share a little bit about um maybe your most recent, the artist in residence program you did at, uh, what approach did you take for that at the Center for Great Plains Studies? Well, here's the brochure and I can always send, I have extra copies to if anybody requests it and I'll send some to you. And this is the one of the important ones here. This has to do with language. I don't know if you can see it very good. It's, it's called, when the language died, she also died. I have a great influence on the language here. so. The whole brochure is bilingual. All my descriptions and everything that I use for my labels are bilingual. It's really important that people see English and Spanish, but that people who don't know English can also see the replica. So that's when I I use that. So, and of course, I always have to include the uh, paper cuts for libraries. And that's my push for libraries. And of course, Wonderful. we do the big one for the Day of the Dead, and that's what that stands for. I do a lot of paper cut, but I, my influence is using a lot of folklore and folk tales and uh, tapestry and and paintings. Of course, in Mexico, when I did, I visited, I want to take those traditions and some of the way they made the folk arts, but to to modernize it to my what I want to use it here. In my art, so it's a it's a it's a blend of using both cultures to make this, and it's Beautiful. called Ticonisma. That so that was a poem, and it was part of the Elizabeth Rubendale Artist in Residence, and yes. it went from March fourth to September twenty second. So I just finished that 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 residency, and I loved it. I love teaching. I mean, you put me in front. And you would never know it. I'm not real shy, would you? <laughs> but, it shows. But my, uh, and and, my, uh, and uh, I know Linda, I'm. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. 
I worked for you when we did that prime time family. Oh my gosh, that was so rewarding. I cannot believe the number of families we had. Six week program, the fathers were there too. That's what was amazing. So whenever we had those uh, meetings, I always brought in bilingual poetry books because it was really important for the mothers to see that they could learn English if their son who knew English could read them the books that were bilingual. But it's not only that, it helps me to keep my Spanish going. And sometimes I forget what those words are and I have to look them up. But the poetry books by uh, Francisco Alcaron, Laughing Tomatoes. And yes, the other one this is what I wanted you to, I, just just to uh, thank you for mentioning that, Linda. And, and you're getting fan mail here in our, our comments section. Uh, Cynthia Douglas Ibarra says how much she loves your art. And Jennifer Norton says how much she loves primetime. And yes, Linda, that's when I first, met you I think was when you were one of our storytellers in primetime and you're just remarkable and uh, and primetime family reading is going strong and it's uh, a lot of the bilingual programs and we just love it here um but you... That moment, because, you know we were the first ones who did the Spanish one in the United States I took training in Louisiana but I mean yes. we, so you're got to be graduate congratulate the humanities Nebraska for bringing the first bilingual one prime Thank time. You. Thank you, Linda. Yes. Um, would you mind? Um, because uh you you mentioned um Francisco Al Alcaron uh Alacron, I believe, Alcaron. Yeah. Um and we talked about that book, uh Laughing Laughing Tomatoes. Yeah. yeah. And, and I'm just would you mind um and, and I'm just gonna ask the audience too, if anybody wants to write a question, now's a good time because I'm gonna ask Linda if she wouldn't mind just giving us a glimpse of how she tells the story. Uh, oh, and then well, I will keep an eye out for questions too on, on anything we're talking about, but you, well, you okay? First, I will that? not give you the title because I'll give it away. And okay. I'm going to do a very short version of what I do because usually it's heavier and bilingual, but había una ratoncito familia. There was a family of little mice. Había papá, mamá, Hermana, hermanito. And that there was a family of mice, the father, the mother, the, the brother, and the little sister. Now, because she was a mama and she was always so scared of what was going on outside, she homeschooled them. But she also used these signals like, we all know what this means, or this means, or listen, you know. Uh, look at me. Well, she used a special one, and she would go like this. And she would always say, cuídate, cuídate, be careful. Because I vivo un gato afuera. There's a cat outside, and everybody knows what cats like to eat, don't they? We all know that. So she would always say that to make sure that they would understand how important it was that they'd listen to this word. Cuídate, cuídate, I vivo un gato. There lives a cat. Well, one day they wanted to go on a picnic. So mother got all the favorite foods of cheese and strawberries and some milk to drink. And they all went out and found this beautiful tree. To us, it's a big tree, but it was just a little twig. But for them, for a mouse, it's a big, big tree. And they comieron and they ate and they ate and they drank and queso y queso y más queso. And they ate cheese and cheese and more cheese. And the mother says, oh, I think I ate too much. And father says, yo también, me too. I think I ate too much. We're tired. We're going to take a nap. And the brother and the kids say, no, no queremos dormir. We don't want to una siesta. We want to play. We want, queremos jugar afuera. And so she says, but, but she go, cuidado, cuidado, porque hay vive un gato. Oh, mama, no, don't worry so much. So the kids went out and played. And the, because of the grass, they went through a little further than they thought. And they came to these wood slats called fences. And they were really close together. So they were able to just put their arms in, inside. And they heard this noise going. And the boy goes, I wonder if that's the cat. So he took another look and he saw this black thing going. And so he, and you know, boys love to tease. So he stuck his arm and he goes, Oh, they got the flaco. 
And the girl Kirsch copied her brother. She goes, oh, look at the black go. That's called a raspberry, by the way. Those are my favorite sounds. And the cat heard this and he goes, oh, what's that? And then he looked and he saw uh, the two little mice. And he goes, oh man, this is lunchtime and I could use a snack. So he got up and he ran and he got off the fence, but he missed and he slipped down. And the little boy started laughing, the girl started laughing and they really started to tease that cat. Oh, they got the flock go. And they stuck in their arms and the girls going, oh, look at the flock go. And that cat hated it and he jumped on the fence. This time he got up on top and he looked to them. And the little boy looked up and the little girl looked and they go, oh, yes, I got them. They took off and they ran and they got, found their boppies and they waking them up. Boppy, boppy, boppy. And the father would wake up, ke, 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 ke. I got, I boppy, I viene un gato y vamos a... And the, the, the father goes, oh, yo no tengo miedo en gato. I'm not as scared of any cat. I'm going to give that cat a pow, pow, pow. You just watch. So he got ready and stood up in his, 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 his stance and started going like this and getting ready. And the boy stood behind him and the girl stood behind him. And here he sees the cat. Here comes the cat. First he sees Los Ojos. He saw the eyes. And then he sees... La boca, the mouth with the teeth. And then he saw the long claws and the father go, oh, it's a gato. And he took off and he ran behind the mother. <laughs> and the mother goes, oh. But the mothers are always thinking, don't they? And she goes, I'll take care of this. So she stood in front of the cat. And he was getting closer. And she goes, bow, 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 bow. and the cat looked at her, what was that? And she did it again. Bow, 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 bow. And the cat got so scared, his hair stood all the way up and he took off and the boy and the girl went off with their dad and they ran home and the father sits on the couch and he goes, oh, yes, I got them. And the boy goes, like his dad, oh, yes, I got them. And the little girl sits next to him, oh, yes, I got them. And the mother comes in walking and she goes, uh-huh, uh-huh, ya te sabes, now you understand. Or in this mundo, and in this world, it's important. It's very important to get the hablas dos languages that you speak two languages. And that's the end of our story called Barking Mouse, and it was intoned by Antonio Sacre. And you can find it in a picture book. And I, and I have Barking Mouse. <laughs> that's a very short that's version. Bad. I usually get the kids involved with the, my, it's a lot longer, but for this purpose, it's just a snippet. Oh, it was beautiful and, and just reminds me, and you're getting lots of little applause uh, from people <laughs> watching. So um, thank you. And just a couple of things I thought about while you're talking. First of all, I loved your side comment about mothers, of course, always thinking ahead and everything, because that's so true. Oh, yeah, you betcha. <laughs> but, you know, storytelling is one of those things that just when we talk about our mission is helping people explore what connects us and makes us human. And when somebody like you is telling a story, and I've seen this so many times, whether it's the squirrely little kids or busy adults or whatever, everybody just leans in and listens because you just pull them in. Everybody loves hearing a story and you just do it so well. Well, one of the other ones I tell is Abuelita stories, grandmother stories, and it happens every time I tell that story, I will have several adults come up and tell me their story about their grandma. Oh, this reminded me of this, this reminded me of that. So it really brings in a lot of conversation. And I'm really surprised about how much they can detail, they can tell me. I mean, the people who are listening, if you have a grandmother story, you need to tell that story. You can write it. You can have your grandson uh, or your granddaughters even illustrated, but they really need to know those stories. I mean, I mean, do children really know what their, their even their parents, what their favorite color is, what their favorite toys is what their favorite things that they did in school and maybe the some of the things they weren't supposed to do kids love that kind of stuff you know I'm sorry. and and that brings us to why we do Dia de Muertos you know yes um, yeah please you share know, memory, you know memories uh, remembrances uh, when I was a, uh, growing up as a kid uh, I heard about La Llorona the, the the crying lady which is legendary in Mexico and 
um, it, it, it's a mestizo tale that started in the 16th century about a woman that um, that took her, her kids with her into the other world. And I, I, I had an experience like that when I was a kid and my grandmother would tell me the story of that. Um, and they and, tell that story so the children will behave, not yes, go outside yes, and come in yes, after dark. I turned it around a little bit, but that's the story of my life. <laughs> but it, when we started doing Dia de Muertos in the late 80s, and it was it, we're influenced by, by Tortolero in Chicago. We're influenced by Martin, Martin Gerardo Ramirez from, um, from uh, uh, Mexico. San, uh, uh, San, San Diego de Alejandro Jalisco. We went to visit them three times. Um, and then the narcos got a little gnarly, so we stopped going. Um, all, all of this kind of codified into uh, what Linda started doing, uh, Dia de Muertos art exhibits, propelled by her need to give artists a reason and a location to express their art. Well, what was funny, I would ask a numerous artists to come and they would say, but Linda, I'm not Mexican. I says, well, you think Mexicans <laughs> are the only ones who die? So it it is really expanded. I mean, it's a popular in Argentina. It's in popular uh, yeah. in Japan. You'll see. We, we were doing it in the late 18, 1980s. People would come up to us and say, you're sadness, aren't you? You, you worship the afterlife, don't you? We, we just kind of say, well, come to our show and you'll see. The, the afterlife includes my grandmother and my mom and my dad and everyone that we respected and want to remember and we to make sure that they don't die the third death. There's a, in Mexico, there's a saying that the first death is when you die. The second one is when you no longer see the body. And the third is the worst one is when you forget their name and forget to say it and remember them. So, Everyone's seen the movie Coco. Coco. It's a good movie. I, I recommend it as a Chicano. Um, and it's changing the, the culture. It's changing the society in America. Um, we, 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 the the, the um, mestizo themed things that we're doing, and I'm saying that because the majority of these cultural, traditional programming that is being done in the United States of America has very deep indigenous roots. But us mestizos, us that I have twelve percent indigenous in me, we saw, we see things such as in twenty fifteen, double o seven. What's his name? Double o seven. Yeah, James um, Bond. James Bond. Yeah, Bob. yeah. In twenty fifteen, he had a movie called Spectre, and in that movie, it began with a Dia de Muertos parade. It was fantasy. There was the government absolutely wanted nothing to do with the other muertos because it was indigenous. It was done in cemeteries and in people's individual homes. And 2015 changed the whole whole atmosphere of doing the other muertos. The next year, the government decided to do their own parade, and it's since then it's been the most popular um, uh, support from any entity of Dia de Muertos in Mexico. So, you know, we're, we're, we're continually changing what is happening. We're going from ketchup to salsa. That, that, that's, that's how I, uh, I identify this movement. Excellent, excellent. Um, I want to back up as we talk about stories. Um, one to share with you, um, and, and again, several more comments, Linda, about how wonderful your your story was an appreciation for you for being a storyteller and, and people loving prime time. But um, also Sherry Beam Calloway, I don't know if you know Sherry, but she's also in our speakers bureau, wanted to mention you, Jose, about as you spoke about uh, Western Nebraska and the sugar beet um, industry. She said um, her memories of the immigrants who worked in the sugar beet fields at their home in Western Nebraska. Her grandfather had a so-called beet shack um, which she has a picture of, the conditions that the hardworking families had to endure, she'll never forget. Tolling in the sun with babies on their backs was something she'll never forget, and just how hard those conditions were. And so if you document that era in a book, she is somebody that you can uh, speak with about that. 
So that's wonderful. I, I love the response this is being because that's what humanity is, isn't it? We're talking yes. and and sharing both ways, though we're listening. And I think we need to do that. We need to listen to other immigrants Experience. and all their stories and their experiences because otherwise. We're, how are we going to remember with our children? You know? uh, otherwise, we walk around doing this for the rest of our lives. <laughs> yes. And ironically, these things are making people feel lonelier, you know, rather than more connected. And, uh, you know, I, I think um, now is a time, especially with problems around the world, where I think we all realize it's so important for us to understand our common humanity and each other's stories. And so, um, you know, you two are doing that um, wonderfully. And um, I wonder uh, before we only have a few more minutes and I'm keeping an eye for any questions. Um, and Linda, you got a shout out from another College of St. Mary alum. Um, oh. <laughs> Diane, uh, I uh, pro or PR. Yeah, I know her very good. Oh, okay, <laughs> good. <laughs> okay. The day of the um, dead we're doing an ofrenda at at St. Cecilia's Cathedral, and oh, we're yeah. doing one at uh, College of St. Mary's, and we're doing one course in our own home. Yeah. Terrific. And um, you can find a lot of that information on our website, the Mexican American Historical Society, H, what is it? MAHSM.org. We have yes. uh, information on that and some of our past. And it's so important during that time, whatever we do, we do a lot of research, and we, it's important to put an educational component and the presentations and involvement with the community. Those those components are so extremely important. Okay, I mean, yeah. we don't do anything just, just to put an exhibit up. You have to have that exhibit explain things, show things, and be there present for questions, I think. So just okay, like we're and, um, I, uh, So could you, that's a good point for us so everybody understands what the Mexican American Historical Society of the Midlands is, or if you could just give a minute on that, and then we'll also show a picture of the upcoming exhibit that you you have related to. Um, I think we were talking earlier about the South Omaha Museum of Immigrant History. Yes. So if you could maybe yes. put that together for everybody's sake. Yeah, Linda and I have such an extensive connection collection that we have used. Uh, we were a walking museum for such a long time we don't go to the Smithsonian or we don't go to libraries for our information. We go to people and we go to our own resources. Well, in 2009, uh, we couldn't live in our house anymore. <laughs> it was filled, it was stacked. And uh, so we, we incorporated into the Mexican American Historical Society in Midland, the 501c3. And we began preparing a repository, which is now grown to almost 4,000 square feet at the, the basement of the old Phillips department store in South Omaha. And about, about uh, last year, an old friend, Gary Castrick, who runs a South Omaha museum, when he was a teacher at South High School, we discovered that he had a museum in his basement. He had a museum in his house. He, was, he ran out of space to brush his teeth. So we incorporated together and became an affiliate agency with them. And now we have a museum at the Center Park Mall, 42nd Street Center Park Mall. And um, we're having a 100 years de la mestizaje exhibit, October 14th through November 20th. Our opening is tomorrow. And after we finish here, I still got a whole night of preparing for it. And we're doing, this is our third exhibit. The mestizaje part is the, the life and blood of South Omaha of people of Spanish surname descent, whether they be Latinos, Hispanics, Mexicans, or Chicanos. Uh, we're bringing that immigrant experience along with the influence of the Polish on polka music, along with the influence of the Germans on the coffee plantations in Mexico. We're incorporating a immigrant perspective on the experience of being a Spanish surname person in the United States of America, specifically in Omaha, Nebraska. That's fabulous. And, and we just shared that on screen. I think you probably saw it. Um, I wanted to mention, um, uh, I think at this point, and uh, Amy Schindler 
is mentioning that we're in Mexican his, Hispanic Heritage Month and, and October is also American Archives Month and Family History Month. Um, so this was perfect timing. She wanted to hear more about, about this, uh, this topic. And so thank you. This is great. And everybody um, can, can visit that exhibit through November 20th. Um, I know I will be. And right. uh, yeah, it's thank you. Thursday, Fridays from four to seven and Saturdays from one to four. Uh, we're a kitchen table graphic museum right now, um, but it is a museum of our experience, of our people written and housed in the community, the history written by those that made it. And uh, it's it's a dream come true. And, and we, we hope without patrons, without people, um, and without young people coming with their aunts and uncles and grandpas, uh, without them, we, we we wouldn't have no reason to, to be doing this. So so we're working hard towards accomplishing yeah. this perspective. Thank you. This is terrific. And just thank you for all of the hard work you do. Um, you have done over the last 50 years and what you continue to do. And, you know, we look forward to uh, continuing to work with you. And boy, we covered a lot of ground. I mean, you just, it, I marvel at, at you and um and i i do you have any parting thoughts that you want to leave us with i have a couple wrap up uh comments but you know i think about that term that um that linda mentioned apantla and this idea of living between two cultures and that's just a a really deep humanities sort of concept there to think about um so any any final thoughts that you have of things that we didn't cover uh, only that being a librarian, research, 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 and ask questions. I mean, whatever you learn, you know, share it. I always like to say, did you know this? You'll see my Facebook page. That's all I have is just the arts, the poems, and, and history, and anything to do with culture. That's all I do. I, I yeah. just. About my parting shot, if it weren't for Humanities in Nebraska, Nebraska, Nebraska Arts Council, if it weren't for the Douglas County commissioners, um, we we wouldn't have a uh, we wouldn't have, have had a, a ability to be public. It would have just been a personal collection that every museum wants to have. By the way, uh, the State Historical Society has asked for it. The University of Nebraska has asked for it. But all it will do is dwell in somebody's basement, like it had been before. Well, now we're exposing the public to it. And uh, w without the support of Humanities Nebraska, uh, we, we wouldn't have been able to empower us. It wouldn't have empowered us to raise above the, the, the weight of the responsibility and, and pop up like a plant and, and flower like we're blossoming into a museum. Uh, and uh, that, that, that's absolutely, oh, it's stunning. <laughs> it's keeping me up at night. So. Yeah. Thank you very much, Humanities Nebraska. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jose. Thank you Linda. You you just, I mean, you, you're you a perfect example of why we love uh, our jobs and, and doing this kind of work. It's a, it's a great calling and so many wonderful people all over the state. And so we look forward to keeping moving forward uh, alongside you in a lot of this work. So thank you. And I want to thank uh, everyone um, for the comments. There's just lots of lots of great comments on here. Just a lot of people sharing their love uh, for you too and appreciation. Um, and mention uh, thank you uh, also to the staff that helped out today. Christy Hyatt Carley and Sherilyn Hansen and Heather Thomas were kind of the key team helping put this together. Um, everybody, we'd love your thoughts on the program. And I believe we're putting a link. At, yeah, there's a link in the chat and we can send that out later too uh, for any of your comments about it. And just remember, if you want to book either Jose or Linda, you can find them in our Speakers Bureau and also uh, Linda for sure in the Nebraska Arts Council Touring Artists roster. Um, and we have one more, uh, we have a Curiosity Connections program next month on November 17th, and it's going to be on Black homesteading, and it's going to involve uh, the uh, Angela Bates with the Nicodemus Historical Society in, in Kansas, and with Denise Scales involved with the descendants of DeWitty here in in Nebraska, and so we're kind of a Kansas humanities Can Kansas and humanities Nebraska teaming up for a, a broader look at black homesteading in the Great Plains. So 
Thanks so much to everybody. Thanks to the National Endowment of the Humanities and the Nebraska Cultural Endowment and the state of Nebraska and all the great donors uh, all over the state who support our work. And we will look forward to seeing you around soon. Thanks again.